Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Suyash Mohan, and today we'll be talking about treatment related changes versus tumor recurrence in high grade gliomas. Here are some of my disclosures. We do work for the ACR Imaging Network, and I have a consultancy agreement with Northwest Biotherapeutics. We have some ongoing grant support that is allowing us to do some of the work, some of which that I'll be showing you today. So as a background, brain neoplasm, the treatment has improved over the years and because of which we are seeing better outcome and prolonged overall survival. But these newer treatments are also bringing about new and complex imaging patterns that were not previously noted. So for example, I'm showing you two cases over here but the top panel is post-contrast T1 and the bottom panel is a T2 flare image and both of these are follow-up glioblastoma patients. Now if you notice that the pattern of enhancement and the extent of flare edema looks very similar but one patient actually has recurrent tumor which is true progression and the second patient has treatment effects also known as pseudo progression. So the point is that conventional imaging findings are uh, somewhat equivocal in this setup. So we will see how we can better distinguish between treatment effects and tumor progression using a combination of conventional and advanced imaging findings. So with this background, the, the idea is to review the evolving landscape of uh, brain tumor treatment, to discuss key concepts of true progression, pseudo progression, and pseudo response, and emphasize specific MRI features that can help differentiate between tumor recurrence and treatment associated changes. And towards the end, I will briefly review some emerging applications of artificial intelligence for better assessing response in these uh, high grade gliomas or glioblastoma patients. So the way I have structured this talk is I will do all of these things and I will cover these topics from a patient centered approach. And common questions that patients ask when they when they come for these follow-up visits is, you know, they obviously, you know, if I have a brain tumor, if so, what kind? And, and the next obvious question is that if there is a brain tumor, what are my treatment options? So I will go over some evolving changes in standard of care. We'll talk about if there are some post-op deficits, we will talk about, am I going to get better? And how can imaging help us in addressing this question? is the whatever treatment they're getting in terms of chemotherapy or radiation therapy. The question is, is the treatment working? Is the tumor coming back? If so, will I have other options and so on and so forth. And I will not be touching too much about the question of survival uh, as part of uh, this talk. So let's see what are we dealing with here. We are dealing with one of the most common uh, primary malignant tumors that we see in the adult, which is a glioblastoma. It is a very rapidly progressive tumor. We have heard about screening for lung cancer. We have heard about screening for breast cancer and colon cancer and so on and so forth. And I'm showing you an example over here to illustrate the point that screening doesn't work for glioblastoma. For example, this was a patient who was being followed up for multiple sclerosis and he was getting yearly MRI scans. This was a scan that we did in November and look what happened five months later we have extensive bihemispheric disease and a butterfly glioblastoma. So screening doesn't work. And this is one of the most lethal form of a brain cancer. It is a very aggressive tumor. And there are two main reasons for this poor prognosis is that there is absence of discrete boundaries. And tumor cells, they extend outside in the normal appearing brain. brain. It is like mixing black and white sand together making differentiation from normal brain extremely difficult. So treatment of treatment options, there are three main kind of uh, ways by which we tackle this kind of a brain tumor. The first one is surgical resection, followed by radiotherapy and chemotherapy with temozolomide. And this is pretty much, this used to be pretty much the standard of care for a long period of time. Now, the, the problem with this is that what we see is what we treat. And I'm showing you this image over here where you can see the surgeon is using neural navigation, also known as a GPS machine that the surgeons use in the operating room. And you can see that they are trying to resect, they are trying to chase the enhancing component of the tumor, followed by contouring of the flare abnormality, which is used for radiation planning. 
So the problem in this approach is that what we see is what we treat. There is significant extension of tumor beyond areas of contrast enhancement that we do not address. And that is where recurrence is seen in almost everybody and hence poor survival. Therefore, we have been trying to come up with novel approaches to diagnosis and treatment for this kind of a brain tumor. Now, there were two major breakthroughs. The first one was in 2005, and the second one was in 2015, exactly 10 years later. And both of them courtesy Dr. Stu, as I'm showing you in this figure over here, he was the first one who found out that addition of temozolomide will improve survival. And then 10 years later, he found out that if we add tumor treating fields or TT fields, as I'm showing you over here, it again improves overall survival. Now, this is what we see. If you do not give any treatment, then these patients will die in three months. If you add radiation, temozolomide to, this, to, to surgical resection, then patients live about a year and a half. And with the addition of tumor treating fields, you can see that now patients are living almost up to two years. So the, the difference in each of these is small, but look where we started and where we are. So therefore, the standard of care is actually evolving over time. This used to be the standard of care, and now with addition of tumor treating fields, this is supposed to be the new standard of care, perhaps with the addition of some type of immunotherapeutic regimen. So imaging, the first part that we play in the post-op, in the post-therapy setting is by evaluating the post-op MRI scan, which is generally recommended that we perform within 72 hours after resection. And it serves two purposes. Number one, to determine the extent of resection. And number two, to identify residual tumor in the post-surgical bed. They also say that we should always use diffusion imaging in the first post-op MRI scan to determine regions of perioperative ischemia that could subsequently develop non-specific areas of enhancement. Now we do all kinds of fancy imaging. For example, in this case, I'm showing you functional MRI, showing motor activation near the motor cortex. This is the corticospinal tract or diffusion tractography. And you can see that the medial edge of this tumor is very close to the corticospinal tract on the right side. And the reason we do all this, this fancy imaging is to aid our surgeons in the operating room so that they can achieve as much as resection as they safely can perform for that particular patient. And notice that on follow-up, there was complete resection of the enhancing tumor, as I'm showing you in this pre-contrast and post-contrast weighted uh, T1-weighted image. Now, on the other hand, this was actually a physician in our hospital, and you see that there was this heterogeneous necrotic enhancing mass in the left frontal lobe, and the left corticospinal tract was very close, almost abutting the posterior edge of the flare abnormality. But the surgeons still were able to achieve a complete resection of the enhancing tumor. But what happened? The patient developed new right side weakness, and he could not speak. And at that point, Trust me, everybody forgot that he had a tumor. The, the immediate question that we got from them and from the wife who was also a physician was, is he going to get better? And he was using his iPad to, to write and he, the first thing that he asked when he woke up in the, in the post-op ICU that, am I going to get better? So how, now I'm going to show you that how imaging can address this question. And so what we did was that we did post-op DTI tractography and you can, and we demonstrated that the left corticospinal tract was actually intact. And there was near complete functional recovery as the symptoms that he was having were due to a supplementary motor area syndrome, also known as SMA syndrome. Now, if the treatment is working, it is great, but if it is not working, then the obvious question is that, is it true progression? Is the tumor coming back? Or it is some kind of treatment effects, which is what I'm calling here pseudo progression or radiation necrosis. So let's take an example. Now in this case, the right corticospinal tract notice was very close to the posterior edge of the flare abnormality and was perhaps somewhat truncated posteriorly. So the surgeon decided to leave a little bit of tumor in the medial and the posterior aspect uh, of this tumor and this was left by design because they did not want to give this patient any deficits. And obviously, on the next follow-up, we saw new thick areas of enhancement right exactly where we saw residual tumor, 
This patient did not see any treatment. Therefore, this is a case of early recurrence or true progression. Now, talking a little bit about perioperative ischemia. So this is a preoperative scan. You see this patient had, you know, recurrent GBM with areas of, you know, enhancing and non-enhancing fair abnormality. I'm showing you a baseline diffusion image. And on follow-up, the areas of enhancement were resected, but we saw new restricted diffusion along the posterior edge of the resection cavity. And this was indicative of a perioperative infarct. And on follow-up, you see new gyriform areas of enhancement and this was actually subacute ischemia, which was enhancing on follow-up and not a recurrent tumor. So the point is that recognition of this perioperative infarct is critical to avoid misclassification of enhancement in an evolving infarct as a recurrent tumor on follow-up imaging. Now let's take a look at temozolomide because after surgery, the next step is chemoradiation. So the chemoradiation, the chemo is done by temozolomide, which is an alkylating agent. And what it does is it adds a methyl group to the tumor DNA that triggers the that of tumor cells. Now you all have heard of MGMT. So what is MGMT? MGMT is basically a DNA repair protein that provides resistance to TMZ. Now in some tumors, this MGMT promoter is methylated. And as a consequence, such tumors become more sensitive to killing by temozolomide. And when these tumors become more sensitive to what we see is, we see increased chemotherapy induced cytotoxicity. And on imaging, it is seen as new slash progressive areas of enhancement, worsening areas of T2 and flare abnormality, which is edema in the early post-treatment period, generally between three to six months. And this is what we call pseudo progression. So pseudo progression is, is important because it is important not to discontinue or switch therapy because this represents a favorable treatment response. It means that the tumor is responding to the chemotherapy. There is more chemotherapy induced cell killing of tumor, of tumor cells. Therefore, it is a good response. Now, if the MGMT status is methylated, in those patients, we see uh, pseudo progression is more frequently seen and this is generally associated with an improved overall survival with TMZ. The problem is that when we see progressive areas of enhancement, when we see new slash progressive areas of or worsening of edema, then it makes us very nervous. And we are very worried if this is tumor coming back or this is not tumor, this is something else. So conventional MRI becomes very limited in making this distinction. So what we have to rely on, we rely on some other advanced imaging findings, advanced imaging techniques that I will share with you subsequently, one of which is MR perfusion. It increases our confidence in saying that this is predominantly tumor or this is predominantly treatment effects. So I will show you some examples of those. Now before we get there, people have looked at a whole bunch of conventional imaging findings to see if some of those can be helpful in distinguishing true from pseudo progression. And out of a variety of imaging findings that they have looked at, they found that progressive subependymal enhancement was relatively specific for true tumor progression as compared to all of the other things, for example, nodular enhancement, involvement of corpus callosum, cystic slash necrotic changes, diffusion findings, etc. Now I'm showing you an example over here. Notice that there was thick enhancement over here and there was progressive enhancement extending along the subependymal lining of the lateral ventricle. And this proved to be tumor progression at a repeat resection. The second conventional imaging finding that I personally like a lot is a simple technique. Just look at the contents of the resection cavity on flare images. And if you see gradual increase in the signal within the resection cavity, then this is very sensitive. And according to this paper that I'm quoting over here, it is 100% specific for cell shedding, shedding of tumor cells inside the resection cavity, causing this signal change. And this becomes very specific for progressive neoplasm. All right, now moving on to some advanced imaging findings. Let's look at this example over here. Now, in this case, I'm showing you there is new areas of enhancement on follow-up, but notice that the blood volume was relatively low. And this 
And this is a finding that suggests pseudoprogression. And that's what we eventually found on pathology that predominantly uh, we saw treatment effects with a very small proportion of residual glioma. On the other hand, this is again kind of similar example, new nodular areas of enhancement on follow-up. And now when I show you advanced imaging, which is in the form of uh, two types of perfusion techniques over here, this is DSC and this is DCE based perfusion. And this is MR spectroscopy. Notice that the perfusion uh, parameters were elevated. There was elevation of choline, and this turned out to be predominantly a progressive, a disease of progressive neoplasm. Another example over here. Notice that this was a right temporal glioblastoma. There was near complete dissection of this tumor with you know very subtle areas of enhancement along the anterior aspect. Now on follow-up, we saw new areas of enhancement. Notice that the blood volume and the uh, plasma volume were low. And on pathology, this was predominantly uh, uh, treatment effects. Now we followed this patient subsequently. And again, we noticed that I'm showing you four time points over here between January and June. Notice that there was no enhancement over here. And in June, there was this smart heterogeneous areas of enhancement in the resection bed. And notice that perfusion parameters remained low. And this was also predominantly treatment effect. So the point I'm trying to make over here is that cerebral blood volume increases our confidence in distinguishing true progression from pseudo progression. Now, similar to combination therapy, which includes surgery, includes chemotherapy and radiation therapy, we have also tried to improve our diagnostic confidence by combining multiple imaging techniques. And this is what we call a multi-parametric approach. We take parameters from diffusion imaging, we take parameters from perfusion imaging, and we take we include MR spectroscopy, and together we calculate the progression probabilities. Now, if the progression probabilities are more than 50 at a particular time point, then that suggests true progression. And if the progression probabilities are less than 50%, then that suggests uh, treatment effects or pseudo progression. So generally, the tumor progression cases will have higher blood volume, and pseudo progression cases will have lower blood volume, but there are pitfalls. It is not always true that true progression will have high blood volume. In some cases, you can have low blood volume and vice versa. Now, keep in mind that there is going to be some overlap because of these pitfalls that I've just mentioned. And the fact that a lot of times we will see treatment effects may coexist with residual or recurrent tumor, which means that you can have a mixed response where you have some areas predominantly reflecting or representing tumor progression and some areas representing treatment effects. The next technique that we use for this uh, differentiation is MR spectroscopy. You can do different kinds of MR spectroscopy techniques, but the one that we use at our institution is called whole brain echoplanar spectroscopic imaging. And what we do here is that we acquire spectroscopic uh, sequences or, or images of the entire brain in one sequence in, in a single 15 minute scan and we calculate different kinds of metabolite maps. We can calculate different metabolite ratios. And then we co-register these metabolite maps to our flare scan, to our post-contrast imaging scan. And then we superimpose these spectroscopic maps and then calculate different metabolites in the enhancing area, in the immediate peritumoral area, and in the distant peritumoral area. And what we have seen is that there is generally increased choline increased choline to creatine ratio and increased choline to NAA ratio in patients with true progression as compared to pseudo progression. And that is what we kind of uh, published in this manuscript a little bit uh, fairly recently. All right, so now the summary is that, you know, how do we do it? Now, two things that uh, we have to keep in mind. Number one, that pseudo progression is a clinical diagnosis which means that in addition to a variety of imaging techniques, including both conventional and advanced imaging findings, you have to consider the clinical symptoms. In patients with pseudo progression, generally patients will remain asymptomatic. In patients with true progression, you will have new or worsening symptoms. Always ask about the MGMT status. In patients with pseudo progression, the MGMT promoter is gonna be methylated in vast majority where in patients with true progression is going to be unmethylated.
usually it is a single lesion in, in pseudo progression. In true progression, you can have multiple lesions, which can be solid or nodular with progressive subependymal enhancement. In patients with true progression, you will generally see increased blood volume, the ADC can be low, and you will see increased choline to creatine and increased choline to NA ratios. So again, as I said, PSP or pseudo progression, it remains a clinical diagnosis, which will require integration of clinical data and imaging findings. It is a team-based approach. And keep in mind that a lot of times you might not be able to make an accurate diagnosis because of coexistence of uh, tumor cells and treatment related changes. Now, this is a new technique that has uh, recently been published and uh, we were able to, you know, get this from Professor Maror in Israel. And what it does is that in patients with true progression, so number one, this technique is fairly simple. All you do is that you allow that you acquire a delayed post-contrast T1-weighted scan, which is kind of a 3D T1-weighted sequence, 45 minutes to an hour after your standard post-contrast acquisition. And then you subtract those two maps. And the concept is that in patients with true progression, the capillaries are relatively well-formed, which means the contrast will wash out fairly quickly and you will see more red voxels, as I'm showing you in this example. In patients with treatment effects, the capillaries are very abnormal. And what will happen is that the contrast will tend to pull in. It will not be able to wash out and you will see more blue voxels. And estimation of red voxels versus blue voxels can give you an idea of whether you are dealing with true progression or treatment effects. And this technique is called treatment response assessment maps or TRAMS. Now some practical tips. Generally, pseudoprogression is going to be a necrotic lesion with, you know, lacy, heterogeneous, feathery type of enhancement pattern, decreased RCPV, and clinically patients are going to be stable with stable or decreasing dose of steroids. On the other hand, if you're dealing with true progression, then generally you will have a solid lesion, nodular areas of enhancement, generally no necrosis or less necrosis, progressive areas of subependymal enhancement, increased blood volume and patients generally are doing poorly clinically with increasing doses of steroids. All right, moving on to radiation necrosis. It is a dynamic complex process that develops over time with significant amount of tissue damage, vascular injury, damage to the blood brain barrier and edema, etc. It can be acute, subacute or chronic and generally it is progressive. And on imaging, we will see soap bubble or Swiss cheese type of pattern. And again, you will see that conventional imaging will have limitations, but advanced MRI imaging techniques will have a potential to better characterize radiation necrosis. I'm giving you an example over here. Notice that on follow-up, there is very heterogeneous, you know, uh, lacy and feathery type of enhancement. Notice that the blood volume remains low and there is a prominent peak of lipid lactate and this is a case of radiation necrosis. Now, it is important to distinguish between pseudoprogression and radiation necrosis. As I mentioned, pseudoprogression is a clinical diagnosis and radiation necrosis is a pathologic diagnosis. Now, pseudoprogression can be mild and self-limiting, but this is usually progressive. And this is a result of a treatment effect on residual tumor cells and associated increased permeability of the blood-brain barrier. On the other hand, this is radiation damage generally to a more normal peritumoral white matter. And they say that, you know, pseudoprogression should replace the outdated term of early radiation necrosis. Now, this is a work uh, done from our institution, from one of our colleagues, and they found that this newer amino acid tracer, which is flucyclovine, can also help in distinguishing uh, treatment effects from, from disease progression or tumor progression. I'm, I'm showing you an example from this work over here. Notice that there is increased uptake of this tracer that corresponds to areas of uh, tumor progression on, on histology. Now, if it is pseudoprogression, very good. We can sit tight, do nothing, and hopefully these patients will eventually do better on, on uh, clinically. Now, if it is true progression, then the question is, now what are my treatment options? So we'll talk about, you know, second line therapy. And one kind of example that I give you over here, which is very commonly used throughout the world, is Avastin or Bevacizumab. Now, 
before we go on to anti-angiogenic therapy, we have to know like how cancers grow and how cancers become more aggressive. And they do this by this phenomenon of angiogenic switch. Now, what happens is that cancers, they acquire a very abnormal vasculature where the vessels are dilated, tortuous, hyperpermeable, and then the cancers grow. Now, if you give anti-angiogenic therapy, they do what we call is vascular normalization. This abnormal blood-brain barrier becomes more normal, and this is by the inhibition of VEGF. Now, let me give you an example over here. Now, in this case, notice that this is pre-avastin, this is post-avastin follow-up one, and this is post-avastin follow-up two. Now, you can see that after giving avastin, the there is a rapid decrease in enhancement. Notice that this, there was so much of enhancement before giving Avastin on follow-up. So some people also use the word pharmacologic debulking for Avastin effects. Notice that this is a permeability map acquired from DCE perfusion. And notice that the blood-brain barrier gradually becomes more normal. But the flare keeps on getting worse. And this is progressive or a progressive tumor despite lack of enhancement. And this is what we call is pseudo response. If you just look at the post contrast T1, you would think that the tumor is responding. But if you look at the flare, then you will realize the tumor is actually continuing to grow. Therefore, this is not a true response. It is a pseudo response. Another example over here, first panel pre avastin second panel, notice that after giving avastin the enhancement rapidly goes away. But the flare continues to increase, pseudo response. And notice that the, the blood volume remains low because the blood brain barrier is now more stable. It is not permeable as much as it was in the pre avastin setting. All right, so pseudo response is not a true anti tumoral effect. Non enhancing tumor continues to grow. And it is questioned that these patients hardly have any overall survival benefit, though they are symptomatically somewhat better, which is the main reason why we gave Avastin to these patients. Now, I've shown you a whole bunch of imaging techniques, like, you know, we do conventional imaging, we do a variety of perfusion techniques, different kinds of MR spectroscopy, and we think that we see a lot. But the fact is that there is still a ton of information that is hiding in these images, and I'm talking about the upcoming field of radiomics. Images are much more than pictures, they are data. So this is a high throughput process in which a large number of shape, edge, enhancement, texture, space, intensity, metrics, etc., are extracted and quantified in a reproducible form. These quantitative metrics can provide important insights into tumor phenotype, as well as the interaction of the tumor with its microenvironment. That is what we call as habitat imaging. And radiogenomics is a new direction in cancer research that focuses on the relationship between imaging phenotypes and genomics, also called as radiogenomics or imaging genomics. And the significance is that it helps us in better assessing for tumor heterogeneity, improved decision making, and improved patient outcomes. Recent example from our tumor board from last month, I'm showing you that we are bringing these advanced techniques, these artificial intelligence based techniques, these sophisticated techniques into the clinic. BTC is our brain tumor conference and notice that this patient had a left temporal GBM and multiple time points which continued to increase. These areas of enhancement, they continued to increase and they were subsequently dissected. Blood volume was not very helpful because of susceptibility from prior surgery and notice that the CBV maps did not show a whole lot of elevated uh, CBV. Now, when we extracted these radiomic features, what we did was that we have, we calculate a score. And if the score is around one, two, three, up to 3.5, then that generally indicates pseudo progression. And if the score is more than three, 3.5 and above, four, five, and six, then it indicates true progression. So in this case, notice that the score was less than three or less than 3.5. And this is exactly what we found on pathology that this, if there was predominant component of treatment effects and not so much viable tumor. So the point is that there are a variety of emerging applications of artificial intelligence that, that we are seeing that we are coming up slowly, they are kind of coming into our clinic and more and more we will see these techniques in our practice.
So what we will see in future is that when we have new areas of enhancement on follow-up, then these patients will undergo some sort of an AI-based virtual biopsy. And that will guide treatment based on what this AI-based virtual biopsy shows. True progression definitely is going to be a change in therapy. If it is predominantly pseudo-progression, then we will sit tight, do nothing. And if this is something in between, which is a mixed response, then it will take into account the clinical status and will make appropriate treatment recommendations. So to summarize, uh, I hope I was able to convince you that uh, advanced imaging techniques are promising. They are establishing new paradigms in brain tumor research and therapy, and they can be used for more sensitive assessment of tumor metabolism and physiology, and hence differentiating treatment-related changes from tumor recurrence in high-grade gliomas. And our overall eventual goal is to potentially delaying recurrence, prolonging overall survival, and improving outcomes for this deadly disease. Thank you for your attention.